one more day that God has given us to worship Christ in spirit and in truth. And so let us be in the presence of God with an attitude of surrender and with an open heart. Hallelujah. We are uh, in these past several weeks going through just uh, standalone messages. Each of us are just speaking from what the Lord has laid in our hearts. And today morning, I would like us to turn to Mark chapter 14, 53 through 72. Mark chapter 14, 53 to 72. It's a long read, so let us keep pay attention as we read through these verses. Jesus before the council. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together, and Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this testimony, about this, their testimony did not agree. And then and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And all they, uh, they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. Verse 66. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she had looked at him and said, you are also with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, neither, no, ne I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and be began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, you, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Let us pray. Jesus, I pray that in a fresh way. You will remind us once again of your glory, O oh God. Bring us into this situation in our imagination, in our holy imagination. Help us to be there, to sense the tension, to sense the scene, to understand what is going on, O oh God, in your heart. To understand what is going on in the heart of all the people around waiting to declare, him, declare you to be crucified. Help us to see the heart of Peter in this instance, Lord, and also put, help us to examine ourselves as well as we meditate these verses together. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let us, my heart this morning is to go through most of these verses as time allows. And uh, I, what I ask of each of us here today morning is to genuinely have an open heart to let the Lord speak to us and to allow him to let us see his glory in this very crucial time in the last hours of his life. 
So verses 35 through 61, and I'm not going to read that again. We, we, are, la- we are given a, a snapshot as to what is happening. We see that Jesus is brought to the high priest. mentioned that he is following Jesus at a distance and up to the courtyard and he sits himself uh, by a fire to warm himself but Jesus is in the middle of the the evil people not being warmed being tied up and so the chief the chief priests and the whole council they're now now starting to come up with false testimonies. They're, they're looking around in the crowd to see if any, there's anybody here willing to, uh, to say something against this man that is standing before us. And this was a very disorganized meeting. They put this together last minute, but they all knew what the conclusion they wanted. And so they were waiting for some matching witnesses, some people that can at least... Con- uh, can at least compare with one another that, okay, this is, you know, because you need at least two people to say the same thing. But here in this instance, you have multiple people saying different things, contradicting each other. And so this trial, this, this trial is becoming a sham. It's almost about to close down. And then somebody mentions uh, that Jesus, uh, Jesus quote about destroying the temple. And as we know, this, this is a this is a misquote of what Jesus said. John records this in John chapter 2, 18 to 22. It says here that so the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple in three, three days. I will raise it up. And then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But John tells us, But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, and he says this, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So we see that this misquoted accusation could not even be confirmed amongst themselves, but the high priest, knowing that this is going in the wrong direction, decided to ask Jesus a question that, why are you standing so silent? All these men are accusing you of many things. And why do you have nothing to say? Verse 61 says that he remained silent and made no answer. So discerning when to speak and when not to speak, it's an evidence of wisdom. It's It's an evidence of one's reliance of the Holy Spirit. And I say that because Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 12, 11 and 12, he said, when you are brought before synagogues and rulers and authorities, do not worry about how to defend yourself, or what to say. For at that time, the Holy Spirit will teach you what you should say. If the Holy Spirit is telling you not to say anything, don't say anything. If, if you are put in the corner to defend your integrity, just let it be. Because if the Holy Spirit is not engaging your heart to say something in, in return, the, the wisest thing that you and I can do in an instance where there's arrows against us, where there are accusations against us, is to remain quiet. Hallelujah. So not getting a response from Jesus again. Verse, uh, part of verse 61 at the end it says, Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. This is such a rich and a key verse. Verse 62 So the high priest, in a very calculated sense, asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? He didn't want to invoke, of course, he couldn't invoke God's name, but he was implying to him that laying a trap for him to say, Yes, that the Blessed, of course, it's relating to God, right? So we see in verse 62 alone, Jesus is confirming his nature of being fully God and fully man, the anointed Messiah in four ways, in one verse alone. First, in, in 62, we see him saying, I am. Some verses, it, 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 it gives it to us, some translations, 
have it as I am in capitals. Uh, some just have it as a normal, uh, normal phrase. We know what this means. We know what, what this phrase is. The phrase means something more, more than it would mean to us. It means to the Israelites when they hear the words I am mentioned, especially the phrasing in that, in that language, what are they remembering? They're remembering what God told Moses, right? I am that I am. Tell them that I'm, I am sent you. And this is where the, the word of Yahweh comes from. So that indicates to the hearers, especially for the high priest, when he said, I am, he is equating himself with God. Now, when we move forward, he says, and you will see the Son of Man. And this phrasing, we also know this, but for remembrance, Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14. Daniel sees visions and he says, I saw in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the son of man and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him or worship him or obey him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, is an everlasting kingdom which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that will not be destroyed. So when he said it in that way, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. He's essentially joining two verses here, and I will show you the other verse, but when you put all these words together for someone who is a learner, a teacher, a high priest, they know exactly what Jesus is saying here. These are not just normal words. When Jesus talks about the Son of Man, what did, what did he say about himself? The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Son of Man has come to seek and save which is lost. And there's a prophecy and Jesus said about this very same event. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So when Jesus refers himself uh, as a son, a son of man, there are instances where he's, he is talking about his humanity and there's instances where he is talking about this very same prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, this divine human being, this, this, this Messiah. And, and this emphasis ha was helpful, especially in the early church, as they were trying to grasp the nature, the natures of Jesus. Jesus has two natures. He's one person with two natures. He's fully God and fully man. And, and, and the, theologians and others, they call it the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union. Jesus, one person with two natures. The next thing that we can see is the clouds of heaven. Coming on the clouds of heaven. Different other uh, synoptic gospels. And in the gospel of John, there's a little bit more description to this. In Mark, he just says, with the clouds of heaven. But this coming on the clouds of heaven, I just read it in Daniel. This son of man who was like the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. This is a phrase that, that is associated with God. And I'll, I'll take you to that verse. Isaiah 19.1. It says, Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. And the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. And the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. So a student of scripture, especially a high priest or the the, the Chief counsel, the teachers will know exactly when he says, right, coming on the clouds of heaven, he is equating himself with God, the power of God. And especially in this verse, in Isaiah, it's talking about the judge, the ultimate judge who comes upon the clouds. He is that divine judge who will execute judgment upon his enemies. What does Paul say about the judgment that Christ will Wield. He says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Second Corinthians 5 verse 10. So when the high priest is listening to us, just think in his mind, he is talking about himself as someone who's going to be wielding judgment one day. So that is for us a reminder as well. As we meditate upon the sufferings of Christ, as we are thinking about Christ, that 
he is a just judge. That there's a judgment day coming that we will be before the judgment seat of Christ. Every single person ever born and, and will be born will be before his judgment seat to answer for their actions. Lastly, Jesus says that he is seated at the right hand of power. As you can see, that one verse from verse 62 combines a lot of different concepts. And, and this phrase, at the right hand of power, comes from Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalm 110 is a very key psalm, especially for the New Testament writers. As you read through the New Testament, you see all the phraseology from this psalm being adopted into the language of the New Testament. And what does Psalm 110 want to say? The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus himself says this verse in, in one of the Gospels. He quotes David in his teaching and, and he says, David in the Holy Spirit declared this. David in the Holy Spirit declared this psalm. And David in the original language saying, Yahweh says to my Adonai, the Lord says to my Lord. And this Adonai, this Lord, is the one, if you go to verse 6 in Psalm 110, he is the one who will execute judgment among the nations. And this same Adonai is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He's a priest, judge, king. And we will see there's one more title, as we know. So this is one of the most cited verses in the New Testament. In 110 verse 1, it is a basis of a lot of the Christology that we see in the New Testament. And the apostles built their doctrines based on, on, on this particular verse. There's one aspect of this that when we think about the Son of Man, when we think about the Messiah and, and Jesus, the most confusing part for the disciples, for the high priest, for everybody that dealt with Jesus is the fact that when is his kingdom going to establish? Is this his Coming, is this the time when he's going to establish the kingdom? This was a threat to those who hated him. This was a, a source of a pride for the disciples. They're talking about who's going to be first, who's going to be at the right and the left hand seat. They're planning out the kingdom plan. And then the enemies are plotting, it. How, how, how can we destroy this person? Because he, he is challenging our livelihood. He is challenging our power. They started fearing the fact that this person could, could take popularity and hold of our nation. So there is a portion in this verse, in Psalm 110 verse 1, which helps us know why Jesus came in the first coming as the suffering servant. It says in the latter part of verse 1, the first part says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Until I make your enemies your footstool. This part this part links to Jesus' first coming. There's a verse in the New Testament that clearly lays this connection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 25 through 27. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put in subjection, put all things in subjection under his feet. This destruction of death, or this elimination of death is not just a New Testament concept. In the Old Testament, there are a couple of verses I just want to highlight. Isaiah 25, 8, he will swallow up death in victory. Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. And so on. That this is a promise in the Old Testament. That God will do this. But how will God do this? The means in which God would defeat death, as we know. Is for him to swallow up death in himself. Swallow up the punishment of sin upon himself. What does Jesus say to John in the book of Revelation? First of all, let's see how Jesus describes, or let's see how John describes Jesus. Revelation 1, 12 and 13. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. After turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was the one like the Son of Man. See that phrasing from Daniel. 
dressed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. Just skipping a little bit, verse 17 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, but he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and last. I am the living one. I was dead, but behold, now I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. So this Messiah that the Jewish people only understood the one aspect of it, one vision of it, one dimension of it, they, for, they did not realize that this Messiah had to come once to bear our sin, to swallow up death, to conquer death, to reign over death. And the good news is that this same Messiah will come again to complete salvation, to glorify the saints, to, to reign forever and ever. That's when, that's when all creation will be subject to him in the way that we know the manifestation of his rule and reign. So what could have the high priest pulled from, from this one sentence? Jesus, may, he, I'm just imagining here that as he's hearing verse 62 from Jesus, Jesus may have been, he may have been hearing Jesus say, although I'm tied up and standing before you here alone, I am the divinely anointed Messiah that will one day rule over creation and be worshipped by all. And, and I am also the one that has authority to execute eternal judgment even over you. As you are here do, have with a sham trial trying to execute judgment over me. And my judgment will be upon all my enemies, including every wicked high priest and religious leaders. So hearing something like this in his heart, the, the high priest in verse 63 of Mark 14, he says, what does he do? He tears his garments as, as an outrage, a performance of outrage. He says, what, more, what further witnesses do we need? The high priest got what he needed. This is the evidence that he wanted. He wanted to provoke Jesus into saying he thought he was provoking Jesus, but Jesus was actually revealing his glory in that instant. Verse 64, you have heard his blasphemy. The high priest is convinced that Jesus has blasphemed. Who, who are the ones that blaspheme? Those who equate themselves with God or those who tarnish the name of God. And the and high priest believes that Jesus has done that, but he is far far away from reality this high priest is so he's he asked the 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 council what is your decision and they all condemn him deserving death there's momentum here to to get rid of him some go even step beyond start physically abusing him verse 65 some began to spit on him and to cover cover his face or blindfold him and to strike him strike him in the face and and saying to him prophesy Prophesy. And it says the guards received him with blows. It's another word of just saying that he, they slapped him in the face. The thing in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8 to 10 says this. And I, you know, he says that none of the rulers of this age understood. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They did not know what they were doing. And that's exactly what Jesus said on the cross, that forgive them for they, they don't know what they're doing. Jesus in that moment stood still, stood steadfast. He could have summoned the Father. He, he, and he said this when Peter took out the sword. He said, you know, you know that I could summon, ask the Father and he will bring for me at once 12 legions of angels, 60,000 angels to defend me. He was doing all these things to fulfill the scriptures. This mockery of prophesy. And that's the last part. We talked about Jesus the king. Jesus the, Jesus the high priest. And Jesus now the, the prophet. They're, they're in this instance alone. This is an interesting part of this narrative. There are several instances here that Jesus already has prophesied. He, like I said, he prophesied that this instance will happen, that the Son of Man will be, will be tied up and taken to the chief priests. And, that he, and that there's some things that are going to be happen that he's going to be killed, and then three days later he's going to rise again. He said in a previous, as you flip back, he, he, said, he told the disciples that you're all going to scatter. He prophesied to Peter that he will disown him three times. 
So if Jesus' prophecy is fulfilled in that moment, and even just a few hours later in his crucifixion, and then three days later in his, in his resurrection, we can also bank on his promises that he will return one day. He will return one day. It has been 2,000 plus years. It has been 2,000 plus years. We're one day nearer to that day. If those prophecies can come true, if those historically proven events happened and Jesus prophesied those things to come true, we need to hold on to the promises of God. Hallelujah. And wait for that day eagerly. Let me invite the worship team in to come forward. There's a part in this that, we, that when we look at ourselves, it is easy to throw, throw judgment at Peter, but to be honest with you, Peter is one of us. While this is happening, while Jesus is proclaiming his deity, his, his messiahship, Peter is off to a distance. Totally clueless of what is happening. He is, he is stuck in his own comfort. He is there to warm himself. He just, just wants to be just in the vicinity. Isn't that like that sometimes? We just want to be in our comfort zone. We just want to be just, we just want to walk in a church and sit there, but not really Understand or partake in what is God doing? What is God speaking to us? Here's the funny thing. When people look at him, he looks kind of like Jesus. Or he, he, he talks like Jesus. He appears like Jesus. That one, lady, one, one of the girls said, you, you, you're one of them, aren't you? The way that he talks, the way that he looks, the way that he interacts. All looks like Jesus, but inside he is starting to be tempted to save his own skin. He is not seeing this kingdom coming to fruition as, as he thought. So he starts to disown and, and, to be, and to just give up on Jesus three times. The funny thing is, or maybe it's not funny, but the interesting thing is that in the Garden of Gethsemane, it is three times that Jesus told him to pray. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. You have the right intentions in your spirit to do the right thing, but your flesh is weak, so you need to pray. And isn't this our challenge as well? We, 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 we are, it's very hard to pray. And that exactly, it's sometimes is the root cause of our, us falling into temptation, is that we are not willing to watch and pray and to be on guard. Look at how far he went. He, he not only denied it, he started invoking curse on himself. Some versions say that he, he almost invoked curses on, on Jesus. Just to prove that he is not one among them. How far have we gone sometimes to prove to some people around us that we are not of Jesus. But we still look and we still look like the, one of those Christians. But we just to prove to, to the circle of people around us, we try to act like them. With that, that was ended. They, they had no more doubts. With him cursing, uh, curses on himself, they knew once and for all, okay, this, this guy is definitely not with Jesus. But what happened? God in his grace sent a, a rooster to crow. That reminder, I don't know if that, that day is today. Maybe you are going through a path in your life and this might be that last reminder for you to turn back to the Lord, to look at Jesus again. How does Peter respond? Peter, Peter cries and breaks down and cries. There's a contrast between the high priest who tears his clothes and a performative outrage. And there's Peter tearing his heart apart, breaking down and crying, repenting before the Lord. I felt like doing this, but you know, as the worship team is going to start singing, if, if you... If your heart is being tugged by Jesus right now, if you want to worship the Lord in spirit and truth, if you want to bow down before the Lord, you have the freedom to do that here in the front. You know, some of the songs we sang this morning said, bow down. And I'm like, Lord, we're not even bowing down. Forgive us for singing that. So if you want to worship the this Jesus in spirit and truth if you want to lay down your life before Jesus if you want to repent of your sin if you want to restore have a restoration in your life 
come forward let us worship the Lord in spirit and in truth let us worship Jesus this suffering servant who is now the glorified Messiah who will come again to judge the living and the dead who will reign will, who will take us with him forever and ever that we will reign with him forever and ever this Jesus let us let us worship him in freedom. Let us worship him. Let us bow down before him. Let us cast our crowns before him. Let us lay down our lives before him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My life is yours, Jesus. My life is yours, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 May your glory be revealed, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Let us worship the Lord.